Hello, and thank you for joining us for another episode of Into the Killing. In this episode, we'll talk about a bizarre disappearance with more than a thousand unexplained sightings. The case happened in March 1988. In early 1988, several songs that reached number one on the Billboard charts are still popular today. This includes Faith by George Michael, The Way You Make Me Feel by Michael Jackson, and Need You Tonight by In Excess. On March 25th, the number one song was Man in the Mirror by Michael Jackson. Also, in early 1988, a popular movie was released. On January 15th, 1988, the war comedy drama Good Morning Vietnam, starring Robin Williams, was released nationwide. It spent nine consecutive weeks at the number one spot. It was dethroned by the fifth installment of the Police Academy series. On March 25, 1988, Bloxy Blue starring Matthew Broderick was released and it would take over at the number one spot. One person who wasn't at the movies that night to see Bloxy Blues was 18-year-old Lisa Kimmel because she had a road trip planned. Lisa was living in Denver, Colorado and she was the manager of an Arby's restaurant in Aurora, which is part of the Denver metropolitan area. Lisa had grown up in Billings, Montana. Her mother, Sheila, was the Arby's regional manager and she and Lisa spent their weekdays in Denver. Then they both would return to Billings on the weekend. On March 25th, Lisa was going to drive from Denver to Cody, Wyoming, where her boyfriend, Ed Jarek, lived. The next day, Lisa and Jarek were going to drive to Billings. Lisa was planning on introducing Jarek to her father and two sisters. Sheila had already met him. Sheila was flying back to Billings and Lisa dropped her off at the airport. The trip from Denver to Cody is about 490 miles and if Lisa didn't stop, she would have made it there in about seven and a half hours. It's believed that Lisa left Denver at about 5 p.m. She was driving a distinctive car. It was a black 1988 Honda CRX SI. She had a personalized Montana license plate that read, Little Miss. When Lisa didn't arrive at her boyfriend's home by early Saturday morning, he called the police in Montana, Wyoming, and Colorado. There have been no reports of an accident involving Lisa's car. Ed Jarek then called Lisa's family. Her family drove along the same route she would have taken, and they found no trace of her. So they reported her missing. It turned out that police officer, Alan Lesko, had seen Lisa on March 25th, just after 9 p.m. He had pulled her over because she had been driving 88 miles per hour in a 65 miles per hour zone near Douglas, Wyoming. Douglas is about the midway point between Denver and Cody. It is about 265 miles from Cody. Lesko cited Lisa for speeding. In Wyoming, if someone from out of state is given a ticket, they need to pay a cash bond. Lisa did not have enough money on her to pay the bond. So Lesko allowed her to drive to a nearby grocery store where there was an ATM. However, Lisa's car didn't work with the ATM. Lisa promised that she would mail a check for the ticket the next day. Lesko thought she was a nice young woman, so he agreed to let her go without paying the bond. Lisa had signed the back of the speeding ticket, and her family verified it was her signature. Lesko had also recorded the conversation he had when he pulled over Lisa. Are you from Montana, are you? Yeah. 88 model? Mm-hmm. Lisa's family confirmed it was her voice. Officer Lesko said that Lisa was alone when he pulled her over and she didn't seem like she was in any distress. Lisa's family and the police believe that after being pulled over, Lisa continued to drive to Cody. But where she went after that was a mystery. Lisa's disappearance made the news and tips came pouring in. 
People were sure that they had seen a woman matching Lisa's description driving a little black sports car with Montana plates that read Little Miss. Some of the tips even came in from Canada. Several tips were very reliable. Some of them had come from law enforcement agents. Several people reported seeing her with a man. The police had these witnesses talk to sketch artists and 17 sketches were developed. The problem was that none of the sketches looked like the same man. So the police didn't release a wanted poster. One thing that the authorities and Kelly's family thought was odd was that in all the sightings, Kelly didn't seem distressed, nor did she try to signal anyone for help. On the afternoon of April 2nd, 1988, a week after Lisa went missing, a man was fishing on the banks of the North Platte River, about 15 miles just outside of Casper, Wyoming. He noticed a body floating in the middle of the river. He called the police, and they fished the body out of the water. It was the semi-nude body of a woman. The body was sent to a local funeral home for an autopsy. The first dental records it was compared to was Lisa Kimmel's dental records. They were a match. The medical examiner determined that Lisa had suffered a horrific blow to the head that would have been lethal. The killer then took his time and expertly stabbed her six times in the chest. Each stab missed the ribcage and several of the stabs pierced organs. The medical examiner thought that the killer used his fingers to determine where to stab her and each stab wound was meant to be lethal. Lisa had probably died in less than a minute. Lisa had also been sexually assaulted. Initially, it was thought she was killed on March 26, just hours after she went missing. There was not much decomposition, but that could be explained because the river was cold. But there were also bruises that indicated she had probably been bound for some time. The police surmised that the body went into the water off a suspension bridge that was about a mile from where the body was found. When they searched the bridge, they found evidence that Lisa was not only dumped there, but she was probably killed there as well. On the bridge, the police found a large puddle of blood and blood splatter. The bridge wasn't used very often, but people who lived in the area remember seeing lights on the bridge in the early morning hours of March 26. This gave further credence that Lisa had been murdered shortly after she went missing. But the medical examiner's final conclusion was that Lisa was killed only 36 to 48 hours before she was found. He thought that she was held somewhere and the killer fed her and kept her alive. He thought that she was most likely held for six days before she was killed. But if Lisa was being held against her will, how did so many people see Lisa and her car during the week she went missing? Well, her car was still missing. The police thought that the killer might have been driving it around to make it look like Lisa was alive. Or a female friend of the killer, or possibly an accomplice, may have been driving the car. A massive search for the car was conducted. More tips regarding sightings of the car came in but the car wasn't found. The police felt like they were searching for a ghost. In the end, the police received over a thousand sightings of Lisa and the car, but they were unable to locate the car. Unfortunately, about six months after Lisa's murder, the case was considered cold. The police simply didn't have enough evidence to go on. When it came to a suspect, the police thought that the killer might be local. The bridge where Lisa was killed wasn't used often, and the killer most likely took her there because he knew it was there. But beyond that, the police didn't have much to go on. The FBI's profile seemed to back up that the killer was local. The FBI's profile said that he was a white man in his mid-twenties or older. He was a lone wolf type of person. He probably lived in the Casper area. 
He most likely encountered Lisa at something like a late night convenience store where she would have gotten out of her car. Unfortunately, the profile did not help the police narrow in on a suspect. We're just going to take a short break to bring you a word from our amazing sponsor, Raycon. Finally, where I live, we're able to start going out again and start being social. I love listening to my favorite playlist on my Raycon earbuds before I go out. I don't know about you, but I love listening to loud, fast music really loud on my earbuds. Right now, I can't get enough of Black Me Out by Against Me, Strangers Forever by The Menzingers, and Shake It Off by Taylor Swift. At the end of the night, when I'm heading home, I love listening to epic songs like 23 by Jimmy Eat World and Outro by M83. Both the fast and the slow music sounds amazing on my Raycon earbuds. Not only does the music sound amazing on the Raycons, but they also have gel tips so they are super comfortable and it barely feels like I'm wearing them. I love it because they don't stick out of my ears. They also have an insane 32 hour battery life, so I'm never worried that they'll die when I'm out and I need to wear them. I can't believe they sound this good and feel this comfortable and they are half the price of other premium audio brands. Raycons also come with a 45 day happiness guarantee so you can't really lose. Give them a try, you'll see what I mean. Create your own soundtrack with Raycon. Right now, criminally listed Into the Killing listeners get 15% off their Raycon order at buyraycon.com slash listed. That's buyraycon.com slash listed to save 15% on Raycons. Buyraycon.com slash listed. Nearly a year after the murder, on March 28th, 1989, a friend was visiting Lisa's grave in Billings. She was deeply disturbed by what she found. It was a handwritten note that was covered in plastic to protect it from the elements. The police were alerted because her friend thought that the note might be evidence. The note was dated 11 88 but the investigators knew that the note had not been there since November. Many people have visited the grave between November 13th and March 28th, and no one saw the note. The note reads, Lisa, there aren't any words to say how much you're missed. The pain never leaves. It's so hard without you. You'll always believe in me. Your death is my painful loss, but heaven's sweet gain. Love always, Stringfellow Hawk. The writing was distinctive because it didn't contain any periods. Stringfellow Hawk is a reference to the CBS television show, Airwolf, which ran from 1984 to 1987, and the fourth and final season aired on the USA Network. Airwolf is about a pilot, Stringfellow Hawk, who uses a high-tech helicopter to go on exotic missions. The police were highly suspicious of the note, and they thought that the killer might have written it. They examined it, hoping to find a clue but they didn't find anything of interest. Lisa's family watched reruns of the show, and one episode caught their attention. Stringfellow Hawk lived in an isolated cabin. In one episode, Hawk's girlfriend lives with him for six days in the cabin. During those six days, they have sex, and he feeds her. Then on the sixth day, she is killed by some bad guys. Lisa's family immediately saw the connection between her abduction and the episode. But this didn't help the police identify a suspect. The police thought that they could use the note for handwriting comparison. But the problem was that they didn't have any suspects to compare the handwriting to. What the police did learn from the note was that the killer wrote it. He was still on the loose. Tragically, the case continued to sick hold. In 2000, 12 years after the murder, cold case investigators reopened the case. There were some semen samples from the rape kit and Lisa's underwear. So they were sent to the crime lab. But no match was found. Then in July 2002, the cold case investigator received a call. A match to the DNA had been found. Fourteen years after Lisa Kimmel's murder, it appeared that the case had finally been solved. 
The DNA belonged to a 57-year-old man named Dale Wayne Eden, who had lived in Monita, Wyoming. When driving from Douglas, where Lisa was last seen, to Cody, where she was heading, she would have passed through Monita. When Eden's DNA was linked to Lisa's murder, he was serving a two- to five-year sentence in a federal prison in Colorado. He was also awaiting trial for manslaughter. The investigators decided to dig into Eden's background. Dale Wayne Eden was born in February 1945. He was the second oldest of eight children. His family moved around the Rocky Mountain states often. Eden's father had problems finding work. He was often physically and emotionally abusive to his family. Eden's mother had severe mental health issues and she spent time in psychiatric hospitals. Eden hated school and he would have rather been out hunting and fishing. He was a loner and he had psychiatric problems of his own. Like his mother, he was treated at a psychiatric hospital. When Eden was 16, he stole some vegetables from his neighbor's garden. He wanted to sell them to buy tennis shoes. The neighbor confronted him and Eden stabbed her in the chest. The neighbor survived the attack. Eden was arrested and sent to a reform school. It was there that he learned how to weld. He was released when he was 19 and he got welding jobs. Throughout the 1960s, Ian was in and out of prison for minor crimes like theft and parole violations. In the early 1970s, he found religion and helped build a church. In 1971, he got married. The marriage was a turbulent one that was often marred by violence. Despite their problems, Eden and his wife had three children. His wife filed for divorce several times between 1979 and 1986, but they never went through with it. In 1986, Ian's wife finally had enough, and she went through with the divorce. After Ian got divorced, he settled on a few acres in Monita, Wyoming. He got it a 1950s bus and made it into living quarters. He had no electricity or running water. Ian rarely stayed in one job for very long because he had problems getting along with his co-workers. He would take temporary work as welder. He would also scavenge. Ian got into serious criminal trouble in September 1997, about nine years after Lisa was murdered. What transpired is detailed in the book Rivers of Blood by Robert Scott, and the following is a summary. Scott and Shannon Breeden were newlyweds who lived in Santa Cruz, California. They had a son, Cody, who was nearly five months old. The Breedens were planning on driving their van from Santa Cruz to Michigan to visit some family. On September 11, 1997, their engine overheated while they were driving in Wyoming. They had to pull off onto the side of the highway into a parking area. There were no facilities anywhere around the parking area. The family ended up being stranded there for the rest of the day and the entire night. The next morning, a man in a green Dodge van pulled into the parking area. The man introduced himself as Dale and offered to give them a ride to town, and the family accepted. Dale was, of course, Dale Wayne Eden. Along the way, Ian convinced Shannon to take over driving. Scott got into the passenger seat, and Dale got into the back of the van. Suddenly, Ian pulled out a rifle, and he ordered Shannon to drive down a nearby dirt road. Shannon had different plans. She sped up and started swerving the van. This caused Ian to lose his balance, and he dropped the rifle. Shannon slowed down, and Scott was able to jump out of the moving van with Cody. Neither was injured. Shannon then stopped the van and got out. Eden, who had the rifle again, also got out of the van and he tackled Shannon. When he did, he dropped the rifle again. So he pulled out a large knife and he pressed it against Shannon's ribcage. Scott hid the baby under some brush and then he attacked Dale. 
Ian was a large man, weighing 250 pounds, while Scott was only 150 pounds. Scott picked up the rifle and struck Ian in the head with the butt of the rifle. He struck him so hard that he broke the butt. Shannon also started fighting with Eden. Scott somehow got the knife and he stabbed Eden in the chest. But not even this stopped Eden. Eden lumbered over to his van and picked up a pipe wrench. Scott got the wrench away from him and started beating him with it. But Eden kept fighting him. Scott picked up the rifle and fired it at the dirt in front of Eden. Ian told him that the gun would blow up if he fired it again. Scott wasn't sure if that was true, but just to be safe, he decided to beat Eden with the rifle in the head, neck, and shoulders. However, the strike didn't seem to affect him. So Scott started hitting Eden in the knees. This finally caused Eden to stop fighting and he fell to the ground. The family piled into his van and drove to a nearby home. The woman who lived there called the police. The police searched the area and found 52-year-old Dale Wayne Eden. He was arrested. He was charged with kidnapping. He agreed to a plea deal and he was given a two to five year suspended sentence. So, he didn't have to go to prison. Instead, he just had to live in a halfway house. One of the conditions of his sentence was that he was not allowed to own a gun. A few months after Eden agreed to the plea deal, he ran away from the halfway house. On July 30th, 1997, a month and a half after he fled, he was found sleeping in his van in a national park in Wyoming. His van was searched, and inside of it was a rifle. Having a rifle was a violation of his sentence, and since he was found in possession of a weapon on federal land, he was sent to a federal prison to serve out his two to five year sentence. On September 3rd, 2001, Eden punched his cellmate, Carl Palmer, in the head. The blow ruptured an artery, and Palmer died. Ian was charged with manslaughter. Because Ian committed his crime in a federal prison, he was forced to give a sample of his DNA. His DNA was then entered into the FBI's combined DNA index system, also known as CODIS. That is when the DNA was matched to Lisa's rape kit and underwear. The investigators knew that the DNA evidence only proved that Eden had sex with Lisa, not that he killed her. After getting the DNA evidence, the investigators interviewed Dale Eden in prison. He said that he had heard about Lisa's case on the news, but he didn't know Lisa, and he had never met her. When they confronted him about the DNA evidence, he stopped talking. The police talked to one of Eden's former neighbors. She remembered just days after Lisa's murder, he started digging a large hole in his front yard. She even had journal entries to back up her memories. The police got a search warrant and they looked around Eden's property. They started digging in an area where a hole had been dug. They found some car parts. One car part they found was a hubcap from a Honda. The next day, they started digging another hole. To their amazement, they saw a distinctive license plate with the words, Little Miss. They continued digging and found not just parts, but the entire car buried. In April 2003, Ian was charged with Lisa's murder. He went to trial in March 2004. The DNA evidence and the fact that Lisa's car was found buried on his property were the main evidence. Also, Ian's handwriting on letters he wrote in prison were compared to the handwriting on the note found on Lisa's grave. An expert determined that they were a match. Ian's trial lasted for less than two weeks and the jury deliberated for less than two days. He was found guilty of first degree murder. He was sentenced to death. At the time, he was Wyoming's only death row inmate. But then, in 2014, his sentence was overturned on an appeal. 
A judge ruled that his lawyers had failed to give the jury enough reasons not to give him the death penalty. The state wanted him to be resentenced to death, but a sentencing trial has been delayed several times. So it is yet to be resentenced. At the time of this video, 76 year old Dale Eden is incarcerated at the Wyoming Medium Correctional Institution in Torrington, Wyoming. Eden has never fully confessed to the murder of Lisa Kimmel. However, based on statements he has made, investigators believe they know what happened to Lisa. They think that Lisa stopped at a rest stop in Fremont County, Wyoming. She may have had car problems, like a flat tire, or she may have wanted to get out and stretch her legs or use the washroom. Ian was known to carry a rifle, handcuffs, and flex cuffs. He probably came across Lisa, who was alone at the rest stop. He probably aimed his gun at her and forced her to get into his pickup truck. He then bound her. He had a winch on the back of his pickup truck. So he probably attached Lisa's Honda to the winch. He then drove Lisa and her car to his property. He held Lisa for six days on the bus. During that time, he sexually assaulted her repeatedly. He then drove her to the bridge where he struck her on the head with a lead pipe and then stabbed her to death. Tragically, this is not the only murder Dale Eden is suspected of committing. Some investigators believe he is a serial killer known as the Great Basin Serial Killer. In August 1982, a woman's body was found in the same river where Lisa's body was dumped. She had been strangled to death. She was eventually identified as 20-year-old Belinda Grantham. She was last seen a few weeks before her body was found at a county fair not far from where her body was found. On September 10, 1982, a young woman's body was found not far from the rest stop where Lisa was most likely kidnapped. The woman had been strangled to death with a ligature that was still wrapped around her neck. The body wasn't identified for 12 years. She was 18-year-old Naomi Kidder. In June 1982, Kidder was hitchhiking from Rollins, Wyoming to Buffalo, Wyoming. Monita is between Rollins and Buffalo. On February 17, 1983, 23-year-old Janelle Johnson was hitchhiking near Sinclair, Wyoming. She was heading to Riverton, Wyoming. But sadly, she never made it there. Her body was found a few weeks later, buried in a shallow grave near Shoshone, Wyoming. Shoshone is just 20 miles from Anita. In March 1988, Lisa Kimmel was kidnapped and then murdered. The last murder associated with the Great Basin murders happened nine years later in June 1997. On July 24, 1997, 24-year-old Amy Robechtel, who lived in Lander, Wyoming, went missing while running errands. She has never been seen again. Dale Eden was known to camp near Lander. A month and a half later, Eden was arrested for attempting to kidnap the Breeden family. Dale Eden is considered a person of interest in the four murders and Amy Robechtel's disappearance. However, he has never been charged. He has never cooperated with the investigators. Unfortunately, unless Eden confesses or some new evidence is found, we may never know if he's responsible for these murders. He may be responsible for other murders that have not been connected to him. Thank you so much for listening to this week's episode. Our producer, fact checker, and sound designer was Anel Cloutier. If you just discovered this podcast, you should check out our YouTube channel. We have over 325 videos featuring bizarre but true crime stories. You can find it at youtube.com slash listed. Well, that's all for this week. Thanks again for listening. Please stay safe and take care of yourself.